I didn't think that I was going to become a different person as a result of it. And I honestly didn't even think that in a, in a physical enjoyment sense that it would necessarily be wonderful. And I know an awful lot of um, trans, transgender people who remain virgins after transition. I know a lot of people who've even had surgery and, and never been sexually active. Three months after surgery, there's certainly a lot of healing was still happening. It wasn't the most amazing thing physically that I had ever felt. You know, it was kind of, um, kind of painful. Now there really is no discomfort um, to to being sexual, and I can have an orgasm, and it's a lot of fun, and we have a fairly regular, fairly I guess normal sex life, pretty pretty much the way you would picture any other heterosexual couple having their sex life. It's uh, pretty, pretty average in that respect. I didn't feel that having surgery made me a woman or that not having surgery would not make me a woman, um, but I saw it as sort of like another, another step in the progression. It wasn't until I had the chance to explore that a little bit that I realized that there was this whole other part of myself that I didn't, that I wasn't aware of. Actually, it was on my honeymoon night. Um, I'm married, and so that was my first sexual experience was um, after the wedding at the honeymoon suite. Oh, well, I was probably 16 and a half, um, and I uh, met a guy at my high school, and he was my first kiss, my first everything, all the way around. And I didn't really know what I was doing. Um, I, my family was pretty conservative, and so they didn't talk much about sex or what it really meant. I really hadn't had a conversation with anybody at all, not even my friends. It was a struggle in my mind and um, to not go there, but I'm very glad that we were able to save ourselves from marriage because now there's a special thing that we're able to share together and enjoy um, together as a married couple. I didn't really think I had to lose my virginity, although, and I was kind of torn up about it at the time. I was kind of like, oh no, you know, what did I do? And um, but I spent a lot of time thinking about it, and then I ultimately concluded that it really wasn't a big deal. It wasn't like a set of keys that you could just lose. Outside of marriage, um, though having sex, of course, physically is a lot of fun and enjoyable at the same time. I think by giving um, away a part of yourself, it can really hurt you in the long run and lose a lot of scars in your life. You know, because I could still have more experiences and it didn't make it any less meaningful. Um, plus, my sex life now, I guess, is a lot better. There was among the early Christian fathers a great, a growing emphasis, emphasis on purity, celibacy, chastity, and a um, denial of uh, sexuality and a belief that the truest and most Christian life was a life uh, of no sexuality whatsoever. Uh, but that had that had nothing to do with protecting the state. It had to do with life in, in the, you know, in the other world and being able to go to heaven. Hey, why is this up on? Well, the Silver Ring Thing organization in, as a whole is a teen uh, ministry that focuses on abstinence until marriage. I think that people, I think you look around and people look at what's going on in society and uh, maybe you look at, you know, the evening news and now you see all, all like these, you know, predators or pedophiles and all these kind of distortions of what a good, you know, like a, a healthy sexual relationship would be. And the goal would be to, uh, to create a culture shift. You know, we want to see the culture shift where abstinence becomes the norm again rather than the exception. Um, seven years ago now, actually, with my daughter, who is now 19, uh, she sort of rolled her eyes at the thoughts, but she's had a few boyfriends, and her, her current boyfriend is very good about it. She's had one who uh, tried to make her change her mind, and uh, she's no longer with him. <laughs> uh, I think it's, it's a shame where today's society is that this, it's not even an option in our, in our schools these days. To, to be able to give them abstinence as an option. All that they want to talk about is what are the birth control options and bringing up abortion and a, that shouldn't even be a birth control option. It's, it's a lot of just to provide hope, to provide an alternate. A lot of students think that, 
you just have to be sexually active. That's just how it goes. And a lot of them uh, are dealing with a lot of, uh, of pain and baggage and things like that. So For me, what you do in prior relationships will affect our relationship. I actually had my oldest son prior to getting married. And um, I've learned a lot from that. And I know that um, God's forgiven me for that and that my child was a mistake, but that um, I want my kids to have the information that God provides in his Bible and his word. You take a fire, you put it in the fireplace, it's warm, it heats the whole house, provides just comfort and security. You take that fire out of the fireplace, you take sex out of marriage, and it burns the whole house down. Uh, we, basically, uh, up here at the registration, we are sizing rings, and um, so we have the ring sizers, and then each, each person is filling out a, a registration form. Um, parents and adults, or adults and uh, kids. So they're filling out these forms and then we're sizing the rings and then they go down to uh, registration to get their ring. And then we're also offering two different sizes of uh, the rings. We have the, uh, the thicker bands and then the narrower bands. And uh, those are the different sizes determine which, which uh, band you can get. When someone chooses abstinence for his or her life, okay, the, the quality of love that they're gonna have in marriage in the future in my, from my experience and my understanding is so much stronger because you don't come into the you don't come into the relationship with a lot of past that you're dealing with. I know you'll date a lot of others before me, so please respect them. Treat them right. How you treat those girls is a reflection of how you treat me. I guess I'm asking you something really important. A lot of comparisons of comparing your husband or wife to all these different people or you know and, and always wondering how do I measure up to this or that or, or any of those types of things. Um, there's just a certain level of trust you know. There's just a certain joy of knowing that you could trust someone with your life to say hey um, you know I'm gonna wait with you I'm gonna wait for you. Wait. Wait. Wait for me for our love for true, genuine love. Because it's not easy, you know? It's a lot easier in today's culture to just kind of get involved with what everyone else is doing just because everyone else says that's what's cool and just buy into it. Um, I'm from Bronzeville, Texas, uh, very tip of Texas. Um, I got involved with the organization because I heard about it through intern, uh, through the internship at Lakewood Church. I got addicted to alcohol. And you see, I was digging myself deeper and deeper into this hole and I didn't realize it. You see, the drugs and the alcohol were there because emotionally I was a wreck on the southern end, so I thought at this end the drugs and alcohol can take it away. Well, no. It made it a lot worse, actually. Uh, when I was 15, I uh, was raped. And I was raped because I had uh, a drug and alcohol problem. And I, I wouldn't say that that was the cause for it, but it kind of did get me into the situation that I was in. Um, after being raped, you know, it was something like everybody, it's really hard for them. And I thought that it would be okay to have sex. You know, I figured I'm not a virgin anymore. I can have sex as long as it's somebody I love. And um, after living that way for a while, I had a lot of emotional baggage, a lot of things that I couldn't deal with anymore that was because of sex. The thing was that I had completely destroyed relationships. I had um, almost overdosed. I had almost been in jail. <laughs> When you're addicted to drugs and alcohol, you, you cannot, it's impossible for you to have a great relationship with people. I felt so ashamed, so dirty, worthless. And at that point, I knew the only one who could restore that is what we like to call it, restore, because, I mean, spiritually you can, was God. And I knew, you know, God, as long as I make my commitment and my vow to stay pure from here on out until I get married, then that'll be my commitment. And your promise to me is that I'm pure. And that, that's how I think of it. It's, it's a, second, a second virginity, um, a second chance, basically. I wish somebody could have told me there's other ways, other things to turn to when you're emotionally disturbed or de um, depressed. So I wish someone would have said that. And somebody would have told me that it doesn't matter how ready for sex you think you may be. You'll never, you never will be unless it's with your husband or with your wife. Heavenly Father, 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 Father. I thank you for bringing me here to You can just look in the. You can just kind of look in the camera. Talk. First sexual experience, 17. I'm gay. It was with a man. Oh, it was in just a scene in bed. Two adolescent boys in love. Virginity loss 
has been and remains this uh, a signal social transition in the U.S. For a long time we were told it has to be love, it has to be love, it has to be love. And then we kind of drifted away from that. And now we're getting, I think, to this place where it's all about physical, it's all about physical, it's all about physical. And just like everything else in life, it has to be a balance of the both. You know, for me, I look back on losing my virginity with fondness. Um, but I do, I wish like I could be, transport myself to 17 again and do things over. You know, like I've learned a lot in my many years now. <laughs> there are a lot of stereotypes um, about men and women and their sexuality that it's very easy to buy into today and simply um, parrot back. I think I became a lot more uh, sensitive to people who actually do think sex is something special and sacred and should be saved for marriage, which is just something I never, um, despite my parents' best intentions of teaching me that, I never actually bought. I wish someone had told me what really could have happened, you know, what, what I was really going to face instead of the high instead of the having fun. The, the sex I was having and the love I was having when I was 16 years old is a lot different from the love and uh, sex that I'm having as a 35-year-old man. But it doesn't, doesn't devalue any of it along the way. It's just different. At the same time, I think that you can lose that innocence around sexual encounters um, at a very early age. You don't get to determine whether and when you graduate from high school. You don't get to determine when you get your driver's license. You can't vote or drink until you're 21. Um, that all these sort of things that kind of are, are part of being an adult. Um, being sexually active, which in our culture is something adults do but kids don't do, um, is something under, under the teenager's control. Right. Mom and Dad went out with the Wilsons. They won't be back until about two. Well, what would you like on your sandwich? Oh, I don't mind. Anything would be fine. How about you? Oh, I don't care. You say. No. Well, what you got? Well, I've got ham, and tomato, mm -hmm. cucumber, yeah. and bacon, yeah. and peanut butter. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We've got a whole restaurant.